Welcome back. This will be lecture 4b. We're going to go a little bit more in depth on typography here. So these are the things that we're going to talk about. For the most part, we're going to be out of uh, the PowerPoint slideshow format and into Photoshop, actually. It's a little bit in depth, and so it's going to make more sense to show you rather than describe it with little screenshots. So we'll talk briefly about, um, first off, making some text on the page using the type tool. Then we're going to go into character and paragraph panels, modifying type, and then finally finish up with some 3D type and special effects. So there's a lot to cruise through here. I'm going to do it relatively quick, knowing that you can pause this video along the way. And it's really just supplementary to what's in the book. So I expect you to go through that, download the sample files there, and follow along with those instructions, okay? So first up, we'll look at adding some type in Photoshop. Let me jump over to Photoshop here, and we'll take a look. Okay, so I have a document here. I'm just gonna jump out and start adding some type to it. I'm on the type tool. If I'm not, I can hit T on the keyboard, obviously. I'm gonna come out here into the middle of the screen and let's just add some text. And I have mine set to center justification. You can change this before or afterwards. But uh, in this case, that's just gonna allow me to type from the center. So let me just add some text and see if I can type correctly here. So there's some text. Now I wanna make sure and apply that text if I want to move on from here with this little check mark, that is the commit any current edits button. Uh, but before we get to that, let me just go through a couple other things with these. So right now you can see visually that I have a underline under my text. It's got a control point here in the middle and then a blinking cursor at the end. My, cur my mouse cursor, when I'm over the text, gives me a little cursor icon. And when it's not, I have a pointer. So I can click around within this and I can modify anything. So if I spelled something wrong, I could change it. Um, I can make whatever edits I want to right here. It's still text, just like any other text editing program. I can modify it from this point. Um, I can also come up here and I can change things like the orientation. I can click this button to change it to vertical type um, back and forth. I can change the font right here. If you'll notice though, when I click on something else like Al Algerian, for example, it didn't do anything. The reason for that is because that's only applying to what I type from this point forward where my cursor is blinking. If I added some other characters in there, they would be in that other typeface. So let me get rid of that. If I want to change this, I have to select the type that I want to change. So in that case, that's where I would change it to something else. So let me undo that, go back. Um, I can also change the font within that typeface or font family. Right now I'm on bold. I could go to light or light italic or some other thing. I'm just gonna stick with where I began and go to bold. All right, so those are actual fonts within that typeface. Some fonts or typefaces, I should say, don't have as many options within the, um, the font family. And, and so there are some settings and ways you can add kind of a faux bold effect. And that's what you see with a lot of text editing programs too is um, kind of fake italic and bold. It's modifying the type. It's not an actual font within that font family, but it has some of the same results. So um, from here, I can change the size of the type as well by putting my cursor over this little big T and dragging. I can type a value in here. I can click the number and drop down and choose a value. And next over, we have anti-aliasing, which we talked about in the last lecture, just so you see some examples there. I'll zoom in. Let's do that right now. All right, so I'm going to control plus on my keyboard and zoom in, and you see those jagged edges there? Let me get even closer. Hopefully that's visible. See on the curves, uh, even on the straight lines, we have some jagged edges, but it's, it doesn't go from black to white. It goes from white to gray to black. That's our anti-aliasing kicking in. If I turn that to none, that goes away, but you get very jagged stair steps. And even at 100, at zoomed out, it's noticeable. So just to refresh from last lesson, that's what anti-aliasing and aliasing do. Um, let's go to smooth. All right, I can change the justification. We said that I can change the color from here as well. And when I do that, I'm still selected, but Photoshop changes the preview. It gets rid of that black selection highlight. Um, so I can see the effect of whatever color changes that I do. I'm gonna just stick with black like I had before. Hit okay. And notice my text right now isn't white text. It's the invert because I have it selected. Hopefully that made sense to you. This little button right here will allow me to create warped text. I'm not gonna go into that right now, but just be aware that that's there. 
What I want to talk about here is the character and the paragraph panels. So this button will toggle those panels. I can get to them also under the window or over here. I might have them floating already in an existing panel, but I'm just going to click on that and you'll see that they pop out. I'm going to float them out over independently. Now I don't have a paragraph of text, so this isn't all necessarily going to apply to what I'm doing. I'm going to skip paragraph for now and just go straight into the character panel. So hopefully this is big enough for you guys to see. I'll see if I can zoom in on it in my recording software, but if not, um, definitely you want to just follow along in Photoshop, open up Photoshop and, and try it out there. So from within the character panel, I can do a lot of the things that I did before. I can change the font or I can change the typeface. I can change the font here within to go with a different uh, variation of that. I can change the size. Now, from there on out, I have a lot more options. Right here, I have an option, and if you put your tool over that, obviously it's gonna show you the tool tip. Now right there, it says set the letting. And notice, uh, again, I hope it's not too small, but try it out yourself. L it's pronounced letting, not leading, like you might think. And that's because the term comes from old handset type where people had blocks of letters that they would lay out by hand in a frame and then um, tighten those up together. They would roll ink over the characters and they would stamp it on paper essentially or stamp paper on it, depending on the type of uh, printer that they were using. But anyways, um, to adjust the space between vertical lines, which we'll look at here when I add another line of text, you would add little strips, thin strips of lead, multiple strips to add more thickness between those, um, those lines of text. So anyways, that's what we're talking about with letting and that's how it's pronounced is letting. You have tracking, which is going to adjust the character in, or the spacing in between characters of a word. So I should zoom out so that makes more sense. So there is minus 480 on letting or tracking. And as I increase that the other way, I get more and more space in between all those. Now this setting right here is called kerning. And you'll notice that it's blank. I don't have an option to do that because this sets the space between two characters. If I select the whole word, that's not kerning anymore. All right, now uh, look down here, as I put my cursor over some of these, you'll notice that it pops up with some variations. And this has to do with some open type features that we might get to here in a minute, but make sure you do the reading and look into what open type is. All right, uh, more stuff in the character panel here as we move along, we've got this uh, vertical scale setting where I can adjust how tall the characters are and we're distorting it that way obviously and I can just adjust how wide they are. Now that is one way to make my word fit a certain space, or my characters fit a certain space without adjusting the space in between those characters which is what tracking would do, right? Okay, so next up we've got a superscript option, I'm sorry, baseline shift, I'm using the wrong terminology, baseline shift is going to adjust our baseline which if you remember looking at the anatomy of type uh, diagram in the last lecture, that, that'll make sense to you. Um, so we can change the baseline of just certain characters within a word, with a word, within a sentence, a whole sentence, whatever. But that's just adjusting the baseline. That's not adjusting our tracking. Obviously, we can change the color from here too. And then we've got all these effects down here. And some of these, for example, if our typeface doesn't have real a bold font option or italics then we can do these here and kind of simulate those we can go into all caps we can go small caps superscript subscript underline and strike through so some kind of standard options there and i'm just going to go through these one by one so you see visually what it is so there's all caps obviously small caps everything is capitalized but we still have a bigger t where it's truly capitalized using the keyboard when i entered it if I wanted to do a superscript, I could do that. It doesn't make as much sense looking at it this way, but if we just did it with one character, for example, you'd see that it makes it tiny and rises up there. Same thing with the subscript. And then underline you've all seen before, I'm sure, and strike through. Uh, that's, those are going to be dependent somewhat on what you've got going on in your text, whether it's going to work or not. And I have only one character selected, so it's a little funky. Now, uh, to get back to what I was telling you before, let's turn off little caps. I should do it for the whole word. Okay, so we're back to normal now. Now, these buttons down here, we have standard ligatures, and a ligature is basically how do characters connect with each other sometimes. I should 
add a word that actually has a ligature here. Let me delete this and we'll say, we'll just do what their example is, fi. And it might not work in this particular word because of, um, or this typeface, so we might have to change that. Let me try and reset some defaults here. All right, so put my cursor over this. And we have something called glyphs panel now. This isn't exactly ligatures, but we have some options for glyphs. This particular one, we can turn on all kinds of glyph panels and we can add in different glyphs. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into that. That's a little bit more. Take the, the advanced class, GIT 34. We'll get into that stuff there. Let me turn that off so I don't get too sidetracked. But anyways, ligatures, as you can see, if you zoom in and do this on your own, ligatures are gonna allow you to um, have certain characters connect better than they would in a normal way. So in this case, this F and I next to each other, there's a space in between those. That isn't necessarily the best way for characters to work together. I lost my type tool. Let me go back in here. And I'm gonna go with a lowercase f. And there you see exactly what's going on. Let me zoom in now. This is a ligature. So f and i together become basically a single character, which is very handy to enhance the readability of your text. That's what typography is all about, is readability. You wanna be able to convey your message clearly, not just make things look fancy. So let's turn that off and you see they jump apart now. So that looks kind of awkward, having those together and butted up. It, it can, depending on your goals. But um, a ligature combines those together. And a lot of fonts, open type fonts specifically, have multiple ligatures that you can cycle through and choose different options. Um, alternates, we can turn on alternates. There are, let's see, it depends. Some, some don't have these options. These are called discretionary ligatures. And so you may have lots of variations of ligatures for a specific uh, typeface. And you can choose between the ones that work good for you. So for example, you may have a title of your document that has a large uh, recognizable text and you're gonna use a certain ligature on that, but you don't want that same ligature to show up on everything else because then that kind of detracts from the, the um, impact of that particular ligature in the title, okay. So moving on, um, if you, again, mouse over these, you'll have different options for different things. Some, again, it, it doesn't apply to everything, but you can apply swashes and uh, stylistic alternates. And again, play around with some of these, titling alternates. And these all depend on what the designer set up when they designed this font. So certain fonts that are open type fonts that are well-developed and uh, typically fonts, or I should say typefaces that you pay for um, we'll have more ligatures and more options. Um, those that you download for free off of uh, internet sites that are two type fonts and things like that, those are typically not gonna have as many options for you and um, we'll give you some different results. You can, uh, again, this has to do with which one you choose, but some you can choose and they will have variations for different languages. I wanna see, I don't know if this one did, does or not, it didn't check it in advance. I don't see any. But some will give you different options depending on um, what language your, your type is, is intended to be in. And then we have our aliasing options down here again. Now, just as a reminder, all of our characters, or all of our panels, I should say, have a panel options button. And in this case, it's important to understand what's in there. Some of the settings that we have in here uh, are just duplicates of settings that we have as buttons in the panel itself but it's good to be aware of what's there because sometimes it's easier and um, more appropriate or faster to get to certain things here. And, and not every panel has a button for every single setting. Some of them you have to go into the options for that panel to be able to, to get to different things. This one is handy right here. I find using that all the time. I'll play with it, uh, a heading or something like that and, and mangle it by just adjusting every single setting. Sometimes it helps just to come in and click reset settings and you get back to basics with just a default font right here. All right, so um, that's it for this part. We'll go on to the next slide in just a second. Okay, I got ahead of myself a little bit on the last section and jumped straight into modifying type, but that's what we're gonna talk about next is uh, continue on modifying your type a little bit. So there are different ways to do that. We'll look at making transformations or applying transformations to our type and uh, also layer effects and styles.
Okay, so I've gone back to just my regular type layer here with no special effects or anything done to it. All our modifications are gone. I want to just jump in and take a look now at the text. So I'm on my, I selected my typography layer. I've made sure that it is selected and not the background or any other particular layer. And from here, I can do a few different things. One is I can transform it by hitting Control or Command T on my keyboard. And then I can use some of the transform commands to do different things to it, like this. I can transform it and make it all distorted. If I hold down Control on the keyboard and put my cursor over one of those corners, then I can kind of start to warp it around and do all kinds of things. Um, if I do that on one of the middles, then I can tilt it or skew it, I guess, is the word. So I have all kinds of transformations and modifications that I can do here. I'm going to click the check mark up top. And you'll notice that I still have a type layer and I can click my type tool, click into that and I can delete things and I can add stuff in. Um, so I've got some nice functionality there. This is not always been the case with Photoshop. So if you're familiar with older versions, then, then, um, you know, this is cool that you can do that. Uh, in the past, at some point you used to have to right click on the layer. Or when you tried to apply the transformation, it would ask you this and pop up a little warning. But I can go rasterize type. And then let me turn this on and off. You'll notice that my my layer, my type layer over here on the right, uh, it's still named typography, but it doesn't have a little T in the thumbnail. It's not a type layer anymore. I can't click into it with the type tool. And I can do things like erase it, for example. Because all it is now is a layer of pixels. So you want to be careful about rasterizing your type. Some of the filters and things that you use may ask you to rasterize it. And if you're to the point where that's okay and that's what you want to do, then, you know, go for it, whatever. But it is a destructive thing to rasterize a layer. So just be aware of what you're getting for that. All right, so I'm going to go back to my type layer here, and it's just a type layer. Turn on my background. And so again, transformations, you can do a lot with that. So some of the other warp tools and things, they, they work, which is kind of nice. Uh, let's go on to another thing. So there, uh, like always, there are a bunch of different ways to do this, but what I like to do is just double click out here on the empty space to the right of the layer name. And that's gonna open up the layer style or layer effects window. And um, there are a lot of settings in here and I'm gonna zoom in, let me back up and I'll zoom in on my type so we can see this a little bit better. Okay. So um, some of these may sound familiar to you and I'm sure you've seen them a million times. Like I'm going to go straight down to the bottom and check this box next to drop shadow. And it's not doing a whole lot there because it's kind of a small one. So let's make a little bit bigger drop shadow. We'll move it over a different angle a little bit and make it a little bit darker. And you get the idea, right? You've all seen a drop shadow before. So this is how you do it. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these different settings, but you have all kinds of things here available like bevel and emboss, which you can add uh, kind of a fake 3D effect. It makes it look like it's chiseled out text or pillowed or all kinds of different things. There's color overlays or gradient overlays. We can put a gradient on top of our text and get some rather nice effects and uh, and dress things up quite a bit. Just be careful because like um, cooking, when you add too much salt to something, it ruins it. Adding too many different effects to your type without a purpose and without understanding of, of how that's gonna affect readability is just like throwing in a whole bunch of salt into a recipe. It's gonna be noticeable and it's gonna be bad. So. Um, don't overuse it. Don't use a drop shadow just because it's there. Um, because it is so easy, it is one of the very much cliched things that gets done to typography in Photoshop and a lot of their programs too. But just because something has a drop shadow doesn't mean it's going to be better. There are different ways to add an emphasis to text and, and uh, indicate hierarchy and importance in your typography than using a drop shadow. So Unless you have a good reason for it, I would typically stay away from a lot of these effects that you can add to a layer. Um, but just know that they're there and there's a good reason to use them a lot of times. But there's also, if you don't have a good reason, you know, it's not a bad thing to skip them or not use them. The nice thing also about these layer effects is they're non-destructive. You can go back and edit them. You'll notice in my layers panel here, I have a little uh, visibility icon, a little eyeball next to each of those. So I can turn off one at a time. 
or I can turn them all on with this master effects version. I can double click on that and it's gonna take me back in and so I can go in and change my drop shadow. I can click the little right up arrow at the right hand side of that layer and it's gonna hide that, but I still have a little icon that says FX that indicates that there's a layer effect there. And I can double click here and go back in as well. I can toggle that open. So uh, in terms of good practices, when you're working with this kind of thing, there are a lot of things to keep in mind, but one is you're not always gonna be the only one that needs to open your Photoshop document, especially if you're working professionally, you're gonna be working with a team or you're gonna be sending this on to the next step in the development process or whatever. These little arrows, as simple as it is, close them before you save your document. It's gonna clean up your layers panel and declutter it quite a bit and it's gonna make it easier and faster for people to navigate and find layers and things like that. It's just good etiquette to do so. So <laughs> that's that, all right? There are a million other ways that you can modify type in Photoshop and I'm not exaggerating. There probably are at least a million. <laughs> but uh, one of them that I, I particularly am fond of, I think it's pretty cool, is the addition since uh, CS6 extended of 3D type. 3D in general, but specifically typography is an easy way to implement 3D in a Photoshop file. So we're gonna take a look at that now in Photoshop. Again, this is gonna be really brief. We're not doing an assignment with 3D type. Um, this is more just to get you introduced to it. Uh, in the next class after this, GIT 334, we go a lot more in depth on 3D type and spend at least a whole week on just modifying type with 3D tools. Now, like I said, I'm not going to show you everything about 3D in Photoshop. That's uh, beyond the scope of this class. But I just wanted to show you how easy it is to get started with it so that if you want to dig into it a little bit more, you can try it out. There are a lot of resources online that will give you some instruction and uh, more information. If you want to just wait until the next class, feel free to do that too. All right, so I've got my text here. There's my type layer. I'm going to switch to the type tool and just make sure that my type is all selected. And again, there are lots of different ways to do this. This is just one of them. But as soon as I've entered my, ty my type, I can just click on 3D. There's a button at the end of the options panel here or the options bar that says create 3D from text. And what that's gonna do is create an extrusion. So let me let that run for a second. It's gonna ask me, do I wanna change 3D workspace or... And then I have this text. And if I rotate this around, oops, wrong way. <laughs> These handles are a little tricky to grab sometime. you'll see that this is in fact a 3D object in Photoshop that I can modify and rotate and change my camera perspective. Let's look at it from the top, maybe. There we go. All right, so that's a 3D object. Now, if I wanted to take this a step further, um, I, I mean, there's, a, a ton of things that I can do. You see, it's a little complex. If you look over where my layers panel was, I have a 3D panel now. I have all these surfaces and extrusions and internal constraints and all kinds of stuff. And each one of them has a properties panel that's different. I can control lighting and shadows and textures and topography of these objects and all kinds of different things. But um, one cool thing that you can do with this is I can actually prepare this for 3D printing. And within Photoshop, I can send it to a 3D printer, a vendor online who will accept that file. They'll uh, test it, make sure that it's all set up properly. They'll print it as a 3D print and everything, in anything from um, you know ABS plastic that, that you see in a lot of 3D prints, all the way up to like 14 karat gold or platinum or sandstone or porcelain or whatever, metal. Um, so. A lot of options for 3D printing in Photoshop, but again, beyond the scope of this class, but just be aware that I can create this object, render it out, and then use that in a flat document to add effects, to make it more visual, to integrate 3D text into a scene. Um, that's kind of a fun thing to do is to take your 3D text and then modify it so that it fits into a photograph and looks like it's a physical object within that environment. So anyway, that's 3D text. Like I said before, there are a million different things that you can do to text in Photoshop uh, besides just 3D. 
So don't get hung up on just any one thing. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you, you play with all the tools and get familiar with all of them and you'll find different ways to use them than anybody else ever did. Um, masking, compositing, uh, adjustment layers, all those things, they apply to type as well. Just remember to try to work non-destructively any chance you get and you'll be ahead.